Hi, everyone. This is Howie Shira from You Call This Yoga. He is um, the founder of a nonprofit organization that makes yoga accessible to lots of different communities. They do great work. Um, and he is going to do a demonstration today about yoga in the workplace to make it accessible for us as well. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Everyone's been really excited, especially since we got a little taste of what we're about to get into uh, earlier this week. So thank yes. you so much. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to you, I'll let you introduce yourself and speak about the organization. Wonderful. Thank you, Open Door and the team for having the faith and trust that we can deliver a program for you. Uh, some of the origins of this organization comes from me laying around, look like I'm doing nothing yoga because of my arthritis. And arthritis is a common condition that we'll have to deal with throughout our lives. Some of it's from trauma, playing sports. Some of it's from the work site because I used to be a dentist. I had to retire from disability 12 years ago from the surgeries, from sports, and also posture. You say, wow, what does a dentist do that's crooked? Well, if you can imagine, they're sitting behind you, and they've got one arm here holding something, and they've got something else, and they're kind of twisted. Then, of course, I'm a human too, and I like to play with my feet, so I stack my feet so I could swivel even more. So that's part of the internal corruption of trying to get the job done. That ultimately led to me not having that career anymore and realizing that the chair can be a corruptive element in one's life if one doesn't have awareness. And that's where the yoga ties in. So about a dozen years ago, we started on this venture with You Call This Yoga and became a nonprofit 10 years ago. And the first thought was the chair is the revolution but the world still likes the mat. So we're coming to you to try to encourage how you could practice yoga throughout the day without having to jump up and down and move all around. Because the intention of yoga is to be mindfully moving while breathing. So how many of you are actually breathing while you're watching this video? So let's start with the idea that breathing is our fuel as well as our currency in yoga. I didn't think about that much over the years, and this is more within the last 10 or 12. I used to play a lot of sports, and it was more about the moving, and the yoga was the recovery, where yoga is really the prep for everything. So let's start with the idea that there's a pose. Now, you may be familiar with yoga, and you've heard the term mountain. I'm going to stand. A mountain is the idea of almost standing at attention. Your hands are near your side. Your heart is open and forward, and your head is back, so your ear is in line with your shoulders. Now, as a disclaimer, I have plates in my neck, so I may not always look the way I speak. Sitting down, when one parks their bottom on a chair, you have a whole different paradigm because you've given up your legs to put your butt in the chair. Now, what I mean by in the chair is back here, just sort of hanging out. And for you folks in the car, if you're listening and maybe practicing a little bit, you might be in low right or leaning back, just having your arm extended and one sort of something, and this out here. Now, how different is that when you're sitting at your desk and you have your arm extended with a mouse and you've got something over here and you might be low like this. So that's almost a low rider without even having the pleasure of the car. Either way, it's hard to breathe. So let's talk about how to position for breathing. Well, I like to think of a referencing called two fists where I would place my feet and knees two fists apart from each other. So I could project down without going all the way to the floor. And then I could notice, oh, I've got man spread, or I'm crossing my legs. That's definitely not two fists apart. So this is what we would call neutral feet, because if you were standing in mountain, this would be about where your feet could be. Then I like the knees this way, because that lines up the long bones through into my hip. Why I'm seated up and forward is to create this downslope 
Because theoretically, when I'm standing, there's a down slope. That was a joke. <laughs> then my tail, when I'm up on this studio audience laughter, then, <laughs> then we have uh, the tail can draw down, and I could lift my spine. Well, Howie, that's wonderful. However, I'm used to having something against my body. I'm used to just dangling and playing. I don't think about it. However, a lot of the practices these days talk about meditation. I said meditation because what is meditation? Am I thinking? Am I breathing? Am I conscious? Or am I sitting trying to remember a mantra? Well, just this awareness of, oh, my feet are corrupt. When can I touch the floor? I call that an active meditation. Where is my grounding? And then I know that most of the time I'll come out of my stuff and do a little dance and then I'll come back to grounding and that's returning to the mantra. So getting to do this other mantra, we have another revolutionary item here besides coming out of the back of the chair. It's called the lumbar limbo roll. Lumbar limbo roll. All right, here's a test. Audience, what part of the body does it go? Say it again. Lumbar. Lumbar. What kind of dance do we imagine that we might be doing? Lumbar. Yes. And is this a pillow? No, it's a? Roll. Roll. It's your greatest roll yet. Just ask Sam. So you can take any blanket, fold it up. You might even double it up, quadruple it up, and notice that you can create what we call a roll. And you could place this in your lumbar area and bring yourself forward onto your chair, out of the valley. Audience, show us your greatest roll. <laughs> See, they already have their props. That's why they look so good. Also, when one's standing, in mountain, the elbow is by your side. And these chairs are good for collapsing, but you see this crunches up here. That's not helpful for me. So I like to think of that concept, the beginning and with the end in mind. With meditation, you've seen people with their legs crossed maybe, or extended, and their arms are potentially palm up. Yet most of the day, I'd venture that you have your palms down. Are we palms down people? We are palms down people. So are T-Rexes and they're extinct. <laughs> Think about it. Got a point. <laughs> Therefore, the idea when your palms are up, it's a receptive position, it's an open position, and I have other references to consider. But my elbow can tuck in by my waist and I have the down pressure of the back of my hands and I could sit up occasionally. People in the car, if you had your lumbar limbo roll, you might bring your seat back a little so you come up the valley, adjust your mirrors, and then you have the potential of having your hands at eight and four. However, when you're slumped like this and your hands are like this, it's hard to drive at eight and four. You might be at 10 and two or midnight. So that said, Consider the eight and four because you're just going from mountain to driving, and therefore it reduces tension when driving. Back to you non-moving people, except swiveling. The idea that you can operate from here might mean that you redefine the height of your arm rests or have none at all. You might put some other item on your lap and have a rest for where you are operating. But the idea is this downward slope occurs in arms and legs. So think about that for a little bit and adjust your space or however you are. You can even use a hand towel, Ole, for making your lumbar limbo roll. You can just roll this up because it's a reference, not a pillow. And all of a sudden, you can create something very thick that almost 
replicates this. And then you may not have to carry around a bath towel anymore. Not that you ever did, but. So this is a reference here, too. So I'll invite that. Explore that. You can even use clothing. So let's say you don't have it, and you eventually learn to sit up, and we want to practice breathing. Breathing is the fuel. It's what we can measure some of our activity with if we're straining or if we're relaxing. So just like a carburetor, which mixes oxygen with fuel, your oxygen mixes with your blood and your elements. So the tool here is the nose and not the mouth. That could be revolutionary already. But the idea that you can keep your lips together and breathe may be foreign at first. So please take your time with this. I like to have my palms up, my elbows by my side, so that I can draw in through the nose. Now, why it's helpful to sit up here is because I could bring my belly up a little bit and extend my lumbar at the same time, pushing my bottom back, and that invites the breath. And then the exhale, I can release the belly. Why the belly is important is because when you get the belly out of the way or belly up, your diaphragm and your lung at the base can drop down, and that brings the breath in some of the time. So the idea is this invites the breath in. Why I like the palms up versus down is the lungs extend up to here. So the idea that you can open the ribs in front and flare the ribs plus the diaphragm dropping gives you a fuller breath. So how's that, the audience? Can you give us a fuller breath? Good, with your nose? Oh, that's a new thing. So the, even that's foreign, but this is the, the emergency exit, but not the optimal carburetor. That's why people may hyperventilate because they're mixing their breath improperly. Or if you're just fatigued, you can only <sighs> just expel, but you're not drawing in. So let's just practice the idea of breathing. Breathing can be a counted experience, which is part of a meditation. So let's say you turn your palms up, you might push your bottom back, let them settle for a moment and practice the idea of breathing. You might count to three, let's say, when you inhale, and a three when you exhale. And see if you could press your feet down firmly and keep them engaged as you settle. You might engage your inner thighs to hold the space as if you were riding a horse, and then come back. Why the inner thighs are important is because that's helpful in fall prevention. So you build this inner thigh strength while you breathe. We'll come back to the thighs later. Moving up the body, I can move my hands and activate my arms a little bit in that cadence, so I'm getting a little more dynamic activity. But the idea is that my feet go down, my tail goes down, my elbows, back of my hands draw down, my elbows drawing down connect to my shoulder blades, which supports my head. Who knows where their shoulder blades are? I don't know, they're back there somewhere, it's another continent. So here I'd like you to think that you're gonna draw those two continental shelves together and hold a walnut for a second and then release the walnut. Now why that area is important is because that muscle connects to the back of your head. I didn't know that. I thought this holds my head up. Well, it does, it just overworks because your hands may be out of position. See how locked in they could be. So I like to think of this as the tail that can wag the dog up here. And when it's waggling down here, your head goes down. And when it draws down, your, you can wag your head more freely. Then the idea of breathing cadence. If you breathe in slowly, 
and do a quick exhale. It's like the little engine that could, trying to go up the mountain or you're trying to rev up. So if you're feeling a little sluggish, but we're not trying to hyperventilate, you could draw in slowly through your nose and you can blow out your mouth or your nose. And that could be also when someone might be irritating you and you might want to let it out even longer. So in that case, we may take a little breath in and a long exhale. It might be called steaming. Also, there's many a scenario where it's better to say nothing than to say something and to give yourself a moment to take a breath. So I'd like to think of how you can use your lips to decide, am I going to do a long exhale and really let it go? Or do I really have to get this out of my system quickly? So those are different tools in playing with the breath. Very simple for the moment. So I'm just going to swirl around here and look at my list of other great ideas. Some of you may have a standing desk. How many people actually know how to stand properly and can actually stand for an hour in an optimal position? So just the idea of having the tail wagging the dog may affect how you support the dog. And where your screen is will influence the angle of your head. Once your head starts dropping, then it's a lever and these start firing. So even if you're engaged here, once you start sloping, it's a challenge. Therefore, it's pretty critical to consider what are you looking at. And this is an old timey picture. However, the virtue here is it shows that the eyes are in the upper third of the screen. If you have a laptop and you don't have a stand that brings it up to a certain height, you're still compensating somewhere in your neck and shoulders and lower back. Here's that reference of the downward slopes, the feet, and then there's a chair height that corresponds. But at this point, it's the, the, the terminal and the screen. Also, there's a keyboard that comes out of a drawer. This predates a mouse, so we can't go there on that. So let's revisit. Mountain, two fists, elbows in, hips higher than the knees when you give it up. That could change all your furniture at home or not but it's an important thing to consider. All right, so what about some doing? What can we do at our desk? Well, first, let's just make sure the desk is healthy. So here, my elbow is down, but my wrist is bent. So this desk is too high for me, and it's not because of my chair, because the chair is a good height. So that would be something I'd have to negotiate or work this out a little differently in my saddle over here. Then the screen, well, it's raised up and you can see there's a ream of paper under there. So you can make adjustments without danger, hopefully, of raising things up so that this is eye level, about two thirds of the way up. So I'm comfortable with the screen. So if I was at a workstation, this could be good. Now looking at the screen, I might be seated and slumped over occasionally. And what's the first thing I could do? Well, I could occasionally just lift up, get my hands either palms up, palms down, if I needed the support, or even neutral. And the first pose coming out of this mountain could be something called cow, C-O-W. Because a cow has a sway back, and it might lift up and move. So in the inhale, you might extend up 
and lift from your lumbar. However, in the exhale, I'd like you to think of just drawing your belly back to your spine. Here's your belly, here's your spine. Finish the exhale, rest. How's it? How's the herd? Good. So let's give a little inhale through the move and exhale, draw the belly to the spine. So this is important because when you sit on a chair, you put a lot of pressure on your lower back. If you are in the valley, you're already laying on your lower back. Therefore, you're in danger of putting pressure excessively as you slump or in your low rider in the car. Therefore, when seated, it's imperative not to come into this thing called flexion any further because gravity is going to put you there. So we're building core strength, engaging those inner thighs by coming up and then coming back to neutral, the belly comes underneath. You can see my fingers, they're not folded, come under my front ribs. Oh, yes, they were. Just kidding. Now for you, see if you could feel your belly come up nice and round in your cow. Exhale, let it out. Mm, you can even say moo. Next time, inhale, bring it up. Exhale. Moo. See, this is Raleigh and, you know, NC State and it's cow country. So bring it up. Bring the belly up to the bar. Exhale, bring the belly back. Now for you gym fanatics, you say, well, how is this exercise? Well, just sitting up is an exercise. Breathing is an exercise. And then I call this the seated sit-up. Because if you went to the gym and you laid on the floor and you bent your knees and you tried to exercise this band of muscle by lifting your head, then really you're just really straining your neck, in my opinion. Anyone else agree? All right, we have a unanimous almost. Therefore, this is a real focused abdominal exercise. Helps to stimulate your organs a little bit by getting this movement. You're engaging your legs. This muscle activates. You can see the quads being alive, and that increases blood flow and cuts off, well, reduces chances of thrombosis. So how's that? Okay, so far? Yeah. All right. Now, we're riding a horse. We're in the Old West, maybe the New West. We're coming into a saloon. So you can picture saloon doors. So saloon doors have levers. Well, your shoulder blades can be like saloon doors also. So I'd like you to just sit up in your mountain, get your hands in open, then we're just going to lift the thumbs up and point the thumbs behind us. So here I'm essentially hip width apart, just robotic. And then on the inhale, I'm going to lead with the back of my wrists. And I'm going to inhale and open, and open the heart, open the saloon doors, and exhale, just let it settle back, not collapsing. So here, we're opening and engaging the shoulder blades down, the heart comes up, and exhale back to neutral because we're just acting like little bellows and we're opening this muscle, which can also be collapsed. So let's try just a couple more. See if now you could press your feet, engage your thighs, push your bum under the lumbar limbo roll, bring the belly up, open the heart and smile. And then exhale, see if you could bring it out your nose while the belly comes to your spine. So we have this inhale and exhale. One more, inhale and exhale. Now I'd like to make a point about the wrists. Many folks are operating with their hands in that T-Rex, which I joke, your elbows may be out. So with physics, when something goes out, something comes in. So I don't know how many of you have shoulder uh, and rotator cuff issues, but this bone is pushing through a thin muscle. So by bringing this down and in, it stabilizes this area. When you're opening this way, you're working from the shoulder blade and not here with a closed lung. 
So you can possibly tell the difference. Can you feel the difference? All right, now what about that man spread? Well, we're gonna take this idea of a blade here and put it down here, and you can see that that's spread. However, the idea to strengthen this is to do a little isometrics. And if you keep this nice and strong, you can use your whole upper body. However, this is a much bigger muscle than this something here. So the idea is, can you keep the elbows in, inhale, press the thighs against the back of the hands, and the back of the hands against the thighs without changing the position? So I call this emerging, you're sort of coming up and emerging, opening the heart. And then exhale, bringing the belly in. Now in the car, at a traffic light maybe, you could do this. Or you could just practice coming up in the saddle a little bit more. Because by doing this, you engage your bum. We say bum? Bum. Bum. <laughs> bum. So this is your bum, your glutes, and that's your other secret weapon for strength of your core. Because most of the time, if you're seated like this, you're just sort of smushing the tush. So here, when you get the feet in line, a little bit of thigh engagement, you can activate over here in your bum and keep the tush pushed back. So there's a whole sort of core engagement here. By doing this, you practice resistance, you keep the shoulder in line, you breathe slowly, and you might be tired and ready for a nap in just a little bit. So shake it out, move around a little bit because this could be fatiguing. I have to check the watch. Good. All right. Now, there's some thoughts about that we grip things in life. And you can imagine you're gripping your mouse, you might grip the steering wheel, you might grip your phone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, it can, can cause a lot of constriction here. However, this is part of an energy flow. So one thing I'd like to consider is, and this is what I do to relax, when uh, there's a situation I'm not so thrilled about, this is a very called calming mudra or hand position. And it's also called a spider push-up. So it's not that complicated. Except adding breath can make it complicated. So you may notice I have my elbows in. And my arms are extended just a little bit. But my shoulder blades are engaged behind me. So I'm just going to take my fingertips together. And you notice that this is still a straight line. So this would be on the inhale and then the exhale. I'm just sort of walking my fingers down to the finger pad and then bringing the palm pad and the thumb pad together. That would be the exhale. The inhale, I would start to separate them, the palm pad, thumb pad, eventually the finger pad, coming up the fingers, coming up to the fingertip, to the tip. Now the next time when you exhale, See how this is concave. So I'd like you to think that your hand is pressing, but your center of your palm is relaxed. Because if you were doing a yoga pose on the floor, we're not trying to mash our hands. That's essentially like having flat feet. But in the physics, if you tried to lift your arch, your feet would press down more fully. Similarly, if you lifted the arch in your hand, then your fingers have, in my opinion, a more even distribution and you're not locking something up top. Does that, does that feel palpable? So see if you can think of engaging the lower body, do your inhale, and imagine these are your ribs. And then when you exhale, the ribs are closing. They may say that's silly, but believe me, as you get older, that mind-body connection is harder to keep. So yeah, oh, I can expand my ribs because I see something versus I don't see my ribs. Do you see yours? That would be amazing. So bring it back. 
One more, spider push-up. Good, bring it back and just shake it out. Now I have used my hands a lot as a dentist. I'm very tactile, but I also have arthritis. And sometimes arthritis can be helped by increased circulation. Now besides breathing, we can also engage. This is also good for coordination or laughing at yourself even more than usual. So I'd like to think that you can take the thumb spaces and tap the thumb spaces. So if we took a breath, open the space, exhale, one, two, three, four. And then you went to the index and middle finger. And you inhaled, and you went one, two, three, four. And you paused, and you went from the middle to the ring finger. And you went, and don't poke anyone in the eyes. One, two, three, four, let alone yourself. And then you went from the ring to the pinky, and you did one, two, three, four. Remember your breathing. Pinky, one, two, three, four. Ring, which fingers? One, two, three, four. Middle index, one, two, three, four and index thumb. Just be breathing. Wouldn't you breathe out? So Either way, just breathe. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Just be remembering to breathe. <gasps> so that's a way to get increased circulation in your hands. It's, a, it's an anti-arthritis technique. So you can shake that out. It's alive. I can move. Wonderful. All right, so that's the hands. I also have other opinions that may not be conventional, but this is for you to explore. You may have seen a yoga pose. Uh-oh, he's getting preachy. Something that's related to this. Anyone ever see a pose like this? Prayer pose. What are you praying for when you do this? You're praying to let your wrist relax and your neck relax, but it's really a pose of deference because you're also often feet together. However, that's fine, but to me, with issues in my body, and already we've got too much tension, having prayer pose in this mode opens to me, my heart, and avoids crunching this, because then I can't breathe. So it is a pose of deference and instability, but why go there if you don't have to? Therefore, to open this allows more room up here because this is already too tight for most people. So therefore, there's a shoulder flow that I'd like to share with you that starts with this because I like the elbows down versus up. If my elbows are up, my shoulder blades are separated and I'm vulnerable to collapse. So what I'd like to consider is on the inhale, as you press your feet and engage your thighs, you can open the space below you, sweep it around, flip the palms up, and gather the space up like a clock, maybe at 11 and 1. I'm going to turn sideways so I don't hit the table. And then I'm going to exhale down, 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 down to roughly about 8 and 4. So it was a clock face. I'll turn sideways. And then on the inhale, hello, Sam. Hello. On the inhale, I'm going to draw back with the back of my wrists and lift my chest up like cow. However, I'm not going to do cat fully. I'm going to do my seated sit up and just bring my fingertips heart level in front of me. Then on the next inhale, I'm going to rotate the palms up to receive as if I'm opening a drawer and bringing my wrists back to my ribs. Then on the exhale, as if I'm quick letting my hands wash, I'm just bringing the fingers up, bringing the sides of the pinkies, palms, maybe forearms, maybe elbows, maybe not, and then back to heart. You got that down? Good. <laughs> Let's try it a few more times. Inhale, press the feet, engage the thighs, maybe the buns too, sweep and gather. Exhale, open down, maybe eight and four. Inhale, down to seven and five. Exhale, bring it across, maybe to nine and three. Inhale, open, bring the wrists back to the ribs. 
exhale, bring it up to 12 o'clock, and rest. Maybe you breathe, maybe you didn't, maybe you reversed, whatever I was saying, it doesn't really matter because you are breathing and moving and you're developing a practice. So if you can imagine if you've been crunched over that all of a sudden you have the potential to maneuver this, but to me it's imperative that you have this downward slope so you can rock your pelvis. It's not just throw your shoulders around. Ready one more time? Take it from the top. Start with your spider push up and, and elbows down. Inhale, sweep and gather. Exhale, open. Inhale, heart. Exhale, seated, sit up. Inhale, open, wrist to the ribs, open the heart drawer. Exhale, scrolling like a book, pinkies, palms, forearms, elbows, maybe, and back to heart. Did you say encore because it feels so good? Inhale, sweep and gather. Exhale, open. Inhale, open the heart. Exhale, bring the belly back. Inhale, open the drawer to your heart once again. And exhale, pinkies, palms, forearms, elbows, and rest. Well, that's invigorating. So that can get you moving a little bit more because you're riding the horse. Good. Shake it out, resettle, move around a little bit. Got a little internal shift here. Good. So we've done that, checking the time. Now, what about some other strength and core movements to build? Because I'd like to go to a yoga class and know more than just what you're showing me. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is this pose looks similar to how you might open up into what's called warrior two or hero two or citizen two, depending on how you see it. But the idea of trying to start from a closed position to an, move to an open position can be rather taxing. So I'd like you to think of, if you're open in Warrior Two, think of this saloon door and making a gooseneck at heart level as opposed to eye level. Because if something comes up, something goes down. And that's hard to level. For me, I have neck and shoulder issues. I've also found that warrior two can be with the palm up. And then my shoulder blades are actually supporting the pose as opposed to my upper trap firing more than I consider optimal. Does that make sense? So if you're carrying jugs of water and you're going like this, you can see that's a lot of here, a lot of lumbering. You might have also seen they had something where the arms were up and they were holding their hands up higher. They had a bar across. Or if you can carry your roly with your palm forward, then you're moving with your torso versus lugging with your shoulder. So that's what we're trying to enhance this here. Similarly here, it's not trying to emphasize locking your trap trying to emphasize extension, and the extension comes from engaging your shoulder blades, engaging your buns, your inner thighs, your heels. So we'll shake that out. So practice that a little bit on your own, warrior two. Now, why did I jump to warrior two? Because of this position. Also with warrior one, sometimes people start in prayer pose and they come into warrior one. But to me, you're coming from a compromised position because ultimately, I just would like to sweep my arms down and back and keep it simple. Now, I've got these chair arms here, and we'll negotiate that. And if you're on a chair to do warrior one, I like the idea of having at least one cheek, if not a little more, on the seat. And I like to turn my foot up. Now, the reason being, I'm going to turn sideways, is when I turn this down, I'm creating this big crease in my foot. And if there's a big crease in my foot, there's got to be something pretty tight somewhere else. So it, it's a lot to come up because I only have the toe tips. 
However, when I practice with my top of the foot down and I could extend through the top of my foot, I have so much more drag. But however it works for you, you know, this is, this could be revolutionary. But just having that resting this way allows me to push my bum back and drop my shoulder blade. And I'm just going to turn this palm up to keep stability on the chair because I really don't know where you're at and what you're sitting on. But in this Warrior Citizen One, it's a back bend. And for me, I would suggest you come up to that position like we did in the shoulder flow at 11 in one, not straight overhead because that puts the shoulder blade out of position. Then I could lift my heart and bend from my shoulder blades, not trying to throw my shoulder back. So this would be considered a warrior one with one arm. Now I can do it with both arms. I'd have to scoot over and this office chair wouldn't be the ideal choice because I've really got to keep from sliding away from the chair. But here you could see that I'm holding the space, but I'm levering over my shoulder blades, not throwing my arms back. And I'm holding the space here, like Atlas, open the world up, supported with an open heart, and then I can bring it back. I'm also trying to keep this spacing. In some classes, they might have you stand in a pose this way. I find that very challenging. Here with two fists apart. No, that wasn't the camera, that was me. I had stability and hip stability, and I could come up and hold the space. I don't have to go super far. I have neck and shoulder issues, but I'm in a core position. Similarly, here, I can come into warrior two. Knee is over the ankle. I'm drawing through the back leg. Strong bun, strong inner thigh, heart level, here and that, either way. So try that if you can. To have a little space, be careful not to knock any coffee over on your laptop. All right, so we're winding down in the program, and you've heard me mention this meditation thing. I use meditation to help me settle when I'm waiting in the doctor's office, because I go there a lot. I do fall asleep, and that's okay. I'm also probably sleep deprived. However, it's also a good tool at any time of the day, even for one minute as long as you're not driving. So that said, consider positioning yourself where you have that two-fisted. I like this because when this draws down, I have a lever to sit up because if I'm not thinking so much, my head will drop. So I like this. Think of being outside and you're laying on your back, so now you're sitting, and you look up and you see a cloud. And we're going to do a, a cloud countdown. So consider positioning yourself, and the team here will also. Then on the first inhale, the, you have your eyes gently closed, and you picture a cloud forming the number 10. And then you slowly exhale that slow release through the nose. And the next inhale makes the number 9. And you slowly go back. And then you can do eight, eventually seven. I'm gonna go quiet so that you can go down to one at your own pace, turning your palms down when you're done. And whenever you're done, gently return your gaze to the screen or wherever is comfortable for you. You can slowly take a breath in and refuel. If you're still counting, we're, we're here with you. Wonderful. 
So that's our first session in worksite wellness with chair yoga. Driving, hopefully it'll change the way you feel after your trips. And we welcome your feedback. You can email howie at youcallthisyoga.org. We also have a YouTube channel, You Call This Yoga, where we have 30-minute videos, chair and gentle mat yoga. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the team here in Raleigh. Rima has a question. Uh, so this was actually from another team. Um, I think you might have already answered this with the spider pose, but someone had asked if you have any recommendations for things to do after getting out of a really stressful meeting. The one minute meditation, but this, I like the spider push ups in the meeting. In other words, under the table. So I'm just venting the whole time. So I'm keeping my energy flowing, I'm keeping my breath. So that's my scent. After the meeting, the breathing is really the way to be in touch. And it depends what other parts of your body may be taxed. Right, if you had to sit a certain way or just shows up differently in your body. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Open Door.